Good evening. Thank you for tuning in to Veterans Voices. Tonight we're talking about veterans and hearing loss. We've got a great show, so stay tuned. Welcome to Veterans Voices. I'm Nathan Johnson and my co-host is Aaron Descare. Welcome, Aaron. Thank you. Hello to you and all of our viewers out there. Absolutely. Uh, Veterans Voices is a monthly television show that explores the important issues that affect the veterans community. We also hope to connect vets and their families to supportive resources and events. We encourage you to participate in the conversation tonight. If you have stories you would like to share or would like to ask a question, please send us a message through Facebook at Veterans Voices One or through email at Veterans Voices at ContraCostaTV.org or call us at 925-313-1170. Our phone lines are open right now and we would love to hear from you. Tonight we have a first for Veterans Voices, a shadow box of a mystery Marine. The box was donated to VFW Post 8762 in West Sacramento. The veteran it belonged to was a sergeant who served in Vietnam as a Marine paratrooper. He was an expert rifleman as well as an expert with a pistol. His home was Sacramento. His name is lost to history. However, through this shadow box, his legacy as a combat veteran of the Marine Corps lives on. This evening, we will be talking with veterans who have experienced hearing loss and medical professionals who are experts in dealing with hearing issues. Hearing loss is widespread in the veterans community and affects all branches and ranks. Let's take a look at this video on how loud noises in the military can affect your hearing. This is what a voice speaking at a normal volume looks like. This is what the sound of a jet engine looks like. An artillery shell. Your favorite band. You're surrounded by loud noises on and off duty. And without proper protection, you will suffer hearing loss. In a few years, this is how you'll hear my voice and your friends, your favorite band, your family. Hearing loss is the most prevalent health complaint among veterans. But it is preventable. So lead by example. Wear your plugs. Wear your muffs. Protect your hearing. Think before you act. Think safety. We would like to thank our friends at dvidshub.net for that video that speaks to the reality that service members face. Tonight, our first guests, Brian Hamilton and Bill Tharp, both suffered hearing loss during their military service. Welcome to the show. Thank you both for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us in. Thank you. So before we get started on the topic, uh, lots to cover tonight. Let's just get a quick synopsis of your military service. Bill, get us started. Uh, U.S. Army Officer Infantry, mm. uh, four years regular Army Airborne Ranger, and then uh, I ran a, my own business for a number of years. Uh, after Vietnam, but it was in Vietnam 66, 67. In all my hearing loss, the basis is just lots of loud noise. Yeah, I would imagine. We'll get talking about that in a minute. Thank you, Bill, for being here. Brian, welcome back. You've been a guest on the show before. I have, I have. Um, so give us, uh, give us our, give our audience another synopsis, though, of your military service. Okay. Uh, well, I was in the Marine Corps for five years active duty. I was a 34, 32 financial technician. Uh, so I basically worked in the office for the most part. Um, my hearing loss mainly is tinnitus, and I went down in, in hearing threshold, and I think it really began just being around loud ordinances and things like that in training mainly, so, yeah. yeah. All right, well, again, thank you both. So tonight um, we're talking about hearing loss, and this first segment we want to focus on really just the origins of hearing loss, give our audience a better understanding and appreciation for really how loud the military can be. <laughs> uh, all of us have served in the military, so probably all of us have a perspective on this. Yeah. Um, Bill, you said you were an infantryman in, in, uh, in Vietnam, so can you give us a bit of an understanding of uh, what kind of noise you're exposed to on a daily basis and how you think that affected your hearing? Well, I think really it started when I first entered the service uh, back in the early 60s. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to the 4th Armored Division and uh, 
I spent about six months in a uh, infantry uh, mechanized unit, but then I spent two and a half years as a general's aide on staff, and all we did was every day we flew helicopters, we went to training areas, so a lot of unusual noises, you know, bombs, cannons, artillery, mm. and stuff like that. So when I came out of the service, I, I had bilateral tinnitus yeah. when I came out of the service, and then it just kind of cooked along, and I went into business, and I didn't, uh, so Vietnam, I didn't, uh, you know, notice it that much. Uh, but when I got out, uh, finally I got involved with the vets, and uh, Gary Viable, who some of these guys probably know, got me involved at the uh, Contra Costa County Center, and I have, I have hearing aids now. I'm on my fourth set. Uh, they, work very, they work a lot better now than they did originally, yeah. and uh, I'm thankful for that, but I get great service at the Contra Costa uh, Contra Costa uh, Veterans Center and our clinic at Martinez, California. These guys are great. Mm. It's really wonderful. So it doesn't cure my tinnitus, but it, uh, but, but the hearing aids help me, mm -hmm. uh, particularly at home with my spouse, mm -hmm. who can't hear me at all, it seems. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so during your time of service, do you ever recall them kind of emphasizing hearing protection, or what did that look like for you back when you served? Well, when we started, we had... Uh, we just had helmets with little, you know, soft uh, sponge ear covers and stuff like that, or, or uh, um, uh, he hearing, uh, what do we call those little things? Earplugs. Earplugs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like little My memory's earplugs. leaving me. Uh, <laughs> earplugs. Tonight's show's on, he on memory loss. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's on memory. With your hearing. But you can't, you know, we, it, it, didn't, uh, it didn't really help that much because you, you had to be active when you were in the vehicles or outside of the vehicles or whatever. So those loud noises just, uh, the hearing protection didn't help. Uh, and uh, in Vietnam, uh, I don't think we wore, I don't remember wearing, wearing special hearing protection unless I was in a helicopter and maybe had a headset on. Okay. Yeah. Okay. How about you? Well, uh, when we were training uh, for combat training or anything like that, and my job, I also was a person other than Grunt, so I was a Pogue, which is a common nomenclature. But, uh, um, we had to wear earplugs air when we were on the range, but when we were doing, you know, training, we never wear earplugs. And the reason why is because we were not going to wear earplugs in combat, you know, and we didn't have air, the high-tech earphones with, with a, mouse pe a mouthpiece or anything like that. So, you know, we're just exposed to loud gunfire, yeah. mainly, um, throwing grenades, stuff like that. But one thing that he brings up, which is true to me, is, uh, well, vehicles. I mean, I, wor I worked on uh, Camp Foster, and right next to it's uh, literally an air base called Kadena, yeah. right? Yeah. And then there's, you know, planes just fly off of that and sometimes I would go to Kadena for certain things and yeah. you know, airplanes are taking off and landing and you know, you don't really think about it but that takes a toll on your hearing. Yeah. Right? But people go to airports all the time. Right. Let's, let's kind of give our audience a better understanding of really the proximity to the, you know, to these types of vehicles and these types of noises that you really experience. So when you're, when you're seeing aircraft take off, you're on engines or uh, vehicles, when you're near explosion, I mean, it, how loud is it? Do you remember ever losing some of your hearing kind of immediately from that or having any ring in the ears? Or, I mean, it's not exactly going to say right. SFO for <laughs> United right. Airlines, right. you know, so it's a different experience. So let's, let's talk right. about that a little Very bit. Very much so. Um, I can recall a time that I was in MCT in, you know, Marine combat training. And uh, my buddy Hage was on a 240, which is, uh, you know, a light machine gun or heavy machine gun. It's a light machine gun. And uh, we, had, we had to engage an enemy, you know, combatant. And, of course, he just lets loose, this, lets loose with this thing, and it's, like, right next to my ear, no warning, right? So after that moment, I started noticing kind of light ringing. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's typical from, from you know, weapons. Mm -hmm. You know, that's typical. Like, that's normal. I didn't even really know about it. And then, of course, you know, I would go on the range, and, of course, we had to wear hearing protection, things like that. But after a while, those things start really hurting you, so you take them out. And, of course, you know, you hear the pops of the, of the weapons, so it doesn't really bug you. But, again, you still get that ring. And sometimes it's kind of deafening. Um, speaking about vehicles, when I when I mentioned aircraft, I was actually on a tarmac one time when a, when a freaking jet just took off. Excuse my language, but a jet just took off, and it's pretty deafening. And I, I sat there for a minute, going, "Wow, that was really loud. Maybe I should have wore something." Yeah. But uh, you know, a lot of the guys weren't wearing stuff, you know. And I was surprised because you know they work all the time, and they're like, "Yeah, they're used to it." Yeah. So if they're used to it, I'm, I should be fine with it. But yeah. and um, I remember when I went for my last hearing test. This is really important. 
and I didn't even know what tinnitus was. And uh, they asked me, do you hear ringing in your ear? I'm like, yeah, I do. And they were like, well, you're also, we noticed that your hearing threshold went down. I was like, oh, well, I'm not really surprised, but what, is, what does that all mean? Like, you probably might need hearing aids later on in life. And I was like, really? I'm like, yeah. So yeah. there's nothing you can really do about it now, but. So it's not just the drill instructors yelling. No, no, no. no. Hey, you're out no. there, you're yeah. in close proximity to these yep. jet aircraft, these yep. explosions and such. Vehicle. I would imagine in Vietnam, there wasn't really um, the capacity to wear a lot of the hearing protection because you had to hear what was going on, right? If you're in charge of a, a unit, having earplugs in meant you couldn't hear from your, your troops or hear from your higher echelon. Um, That's true. Yeah. Yeah. So it, that's just the way it was. You needed to hear, so unfortunately you also had to hear you know, the, the, the... I mean, whenever you could protect yourself, you, you would do that. But mm -hmm. there were occasions that you just, you didn't have a choice. Yeah. yeah. I remember when I was in, I mean, some of it was probably, you know, ridiculous that I did, but I'd stand on the back of the ship and watch a Harrier, which is a, um, a jet that, that takes off vertically, and I'd stand on the back of the ship and allow this thing to just go right over my head, and I'd plug my ears with my fingers, which you know was probably the best I could do, and I thought I'd be fine. So right. probably some of those situations I could have thought a little bit better about yeah. the circumstance, yeah. but some of the circumstances though, yeah. like monitoring radios in the back of an Amtrak, um, if I had earplugs in, I couldn't hear yeah. what the conversation was on the radio, so yeah. it wouldn't make any sense. So I'd try to hold it closer to my ear and block the noise, but then I'd have to turn the volume up on the radio so I could understand. I'm sure you've had some yeah. experience. You, you're in there so for So for me, um, because I work in AeroVac by trade, um, we have a two-fold mission where we're out on the, uh, the aircraft also putting patients on board, uh, yeah. right? So there's a lot of loud aircraft <laughs> throughout that whole process of loading and offloading patients. So we are, we, they stress hearing protection, but for the same reason mm -hmm. when we have to make commands to move, it's hard <laughs> for people to hear that if they have stuff in their ear. So I've definitely had that same exposure as well. So, yeah. Yeah. And I know that earlier we spoke and you talked about the fact that you immediately went ahead and went and got checked out for your hearing and you would encourage others to well yes I would I you know our our head the veteran service officer here in Contra Costa Gary Viabla um, got what was just got after me I didn't do anything until about oh oh five I think 2005 yeah. so something like 30 years after yeah. you've been out yeah wow. right and uh, so he finally got me in and they got me under the agent orange deal and we went through a whole bunch of stuff and it turned out that uh, they validated my my tinnitus yeah. and other you know I don't have a I, I don't have a I'm still zero percent hearing loss mm -hmm. and I can't understand that after all these years mm -hmm. and I argue with the vet guys all the time yeah. <laughs> but in any event you know I got to encourage you go to the vet office get checked out get in the system uh, you've earned it mm -hmm. and yeah. Take advantage of it. Yeah, it really is very helpful, yeah. and our 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 service office is terrific. Awesome. Yeah. Nathan, thank you very much. Thanks, Bill. My honor. <laughs> well, Bill, thank you for being on, and we'll have you back on for another segment. Brian, thank you as well for sharing about your noise exposure in the military. Thank you. Uh, I want to again thank Brian and Bill for sharing their stories with us. Later tonight, we will be talking with two audiologists that are experts in veterans' hearing issues. They will be taking live call in questions, so stay tuned. We'll be right back after this message from the 2020 Census. How will 2020 Census data be used? Where there are more people, there are more needs for public services. That's why the Census is used by the government to inform funding decisions each year. But that's not all. It's also used by nonprofits to inform services, by businesses to create jobs, and even by students for school projects. Understanding how the population changes helps us shape communities across the country for the better. Shape your future. Start here. Visit 2020census.gov. Is my 2020 census data safe? After sending your census response, your personal information is kept safe. By law, it can't be shared with any other government agency, law enforcement, or landlord. No one. So take your 2020 census with peace of mind. Shape your future. Start here. Visit 2020census.gov. Welcome back. Have something to say about hearing loss? Call us right now at 925-313-1170. Our phone lines are open. We encourage you to connect with us. You may have your own hearing-related questions for our doctors of audiology. 
That segment will be coming up real soon. But for now, our next guest is veteran who has helped his family battle hearing issues and relearn how to hear. I want to welcome Carl Swanson to the show. How you doing you. tonight, sir? Thank you. It's nice to be here. Good. So tell us a little bit about your military service. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, when I uh, was uh, of uh, draft age, I um, was in uh, school at um, uh, Iowa State University, and I was uh, doing my uh, master's degree in metallurgical engineering. Um, unfortunately, about uh, the, the day before I uh, um, was to get married, I got my uh, 1A classification. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I fought that, uh, being in graduate school, I fought that for nine months. And that's the uh, maximum amount of time I could have and uh, was therefore obligated to go uh, into uh, the service. You ended and, up in Vietnam, right? Weren't you? Yeah, you ended up in Vietnam. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, what happened is is that I I went to um, uh, school or or uh, uh, basic training in uh, um, in uh, Fort Lewis, and uh, then went from there to um, to uh, uh, officer um, uh, non commissioned officers candidate school and uh, in uh, Fort Benning. And uh, then uh, it was just a hop, skip, and a jump to, um, to the uh, 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 airborne training. And uh, from there, um, I had to go over to Vietnam. Well, thank you. Yeah. And we're glad you made it back home safely. Yeah. So this segment is a little bit different. Although you are a Vietnam veteran, you're really here to share about your experience of helping two family members uh, in your household sure. who suffer from significant hearing loss. That's right. And theirs is not so much related to noise exposure, you said earlier, but maybe related to a medical condition. So tell us a little bit about how this hearing loss developed for them, but really share a lot about how, the, how they got help sure. and how this treatment has improved their life. Okay. Uh, well, uh, my family didn't experience any hearing um, uh, loss or effects uh, until about, uh, oh, I'd say 30 years after um, I got out of the service. And they, uh, uh, w my wife uh, worked uh, close to an escalator and she complained for a while about that uh, creating noise problems. Mm. But uh, she didn't uh, really understand that um, she had a hearing loss which was probably uh, probably hereditary okay. and um, the, this hereditary problem is that she uh, lost the hairs in her cochlea and those uh, hairs in her cochlea are essential to sending messages to your brain and so um, uh, she had to come up with some way of uh, being able to hear and it uh, turned out that um, the only thing available to her was to uh, have a cochlear implant. And that um, uh, sent her on a journey of looking to the internet and trying to find out what she could use to improve that. And uh, then uh, after she had the, uh, that problem for about six years, we found out that my son had a similar problem and it was a loss of his, his uh, the hairs in her, his ears. Mm. And um, it, it didn't transmit the uh, sound to the, uh, um, the uh, auditory nerve right. and uh, couldn't, couldn't hear then. Yeah. Did you have to encourage them to go out and seek help or did they ask for it on their own? Well, my wife did it on her own. She, she did the scouting for, for what could be done, and then she went to see the doctors, and uh, uh, it, it turned out that she needed the cochlear implant. For my uh, young, uh, youngest son, my oldest son has a little bit of hearing problem, but not to the extent that my youngest son does. And he... Um, uh, it was kind of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, not that interested in showing that he had a hearing problem. Yeah. 
And uh, it took him a little while to get uh, our convincing to tell him he, he had better do it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, he went and found out that he had to have similar technology, uh, a cochlear implant, uh, in order to resolve his problems. So now we have just a minute left. Now that they've had this surgery done, how is life for them today? Oh, okay. Well, it's for me, too. <laughs> how is it <laughs> for me today? I, I just uh, can relate one special uh, experience I had is um, when uh, we were both, my son and I were eating together, and uh, I was moving, like, say, the peas and carrots off the plate into a, a place where I could get them with a fork. And he could hear that scratching against the, against the plate. And he objected to it full, uh, really uh, severely. And so I, I didn't think about it much. And then another night, I did it the same way. And, and so uh, it was, it, it's a challenge. Yeah. Uh, for my wife, it's a case where um, she uh, turns the volume on the TV down because she can hear so much better. Oh, and of course, yeah. she sits closer to the TV than I normally did. did. And um, then um, I uh, can't hear it. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, she's got better hearing yeah, than you. At this well, point. that's right. That's right. And maybe I should have uh, hearing aids, but <laughs> I'd, I still think that I would probably have to have, uh, uh, have her turn up the, the, the volume on TV. So lots of times we sit there uh, individually uh, watching the TV uh, and the other person would be in another room. Right. Well, we thank right. you so much for sharing this experience yes, with us. Um, after the break, we will talk with two audiologists who have extensive experience helping veterans improve their hearing. They will be here to take your live questions. So call us right now at 925-313-1170. Can one girl in a small town, an architect in a major city, and a suburban high school coach shape the future of the United States? Yes, they can. Because every 10 years, the census gives us that power. You can shape your future by responding to the 2020 census. Where do we need new roads to make our lives easier? Where will new school programs help our children thrive? Where could a new health clinic benefit neighborhoods? The 2020 census will inform these decisions and shape how billions of dollars will be distributed to communities like yours each year. And in 2020, you can respond to the census online, by phone, or by mail. It's easy, safe, and important. Make sure you and everyone you know is counted. Now is the time for you to get involved. Your community needs you. Together, we can educate and excite, inspire and make sure every voice is heard. Together, we can shape our future. Welcome back. We're talking about hearing loss. That's right, hearing loss. We want to welcome you to contact us with your questions. Send us a message through Facebook at Veterans Voices One, email at Veterans Voices at ContraCostaTV.org, or you can reach us by phone at 925 313 1170. We know you're out there. You've been a little quiet tonight. Maybe tonight's topic is a little sensitive. Maybe it's hard to talk about hearing loss. Um, maybe it's hard to realize that you have hearing loss. So if you may have experienced this condition yourself, or you think you have a family member, who experiences this condition, this is an opportunity for you to ask the questions or make a comment and realize that you're not the only one out there. Our guests are Dr. Dimitri Pelilius and Dr. John Kelly, and we have Bill Tharp, our v uh, Vietnam veteran, back on the set as well. Both our audiologists serve the veterans community, and I want to remind you that these doctors' opinions should not be taken as medical advice. They're not here to tell you medically what you should do. They're here to give you some good um, a good understanding, some good knowledge, a good base of where to start. So go to your private physician and have a consult consultation with your private physician on what you should do medically to treat any type of hearing loss 
or tinnitus. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Thank you for Thank having you. us. And Dr. Palilius, you've been on the show. You were on our Ask the Doctor episode recently. Yeah. But real quickly, give us a, just a brief summary of, of who you are. Sure. So uh, I'm a private practice audiologist, and most of my, um, most of my career has been spent in um, hearing loss prevention in a variety of different categories. All right, thank you, and welcome back. Mm -hmm. Dr. You. Kelly. Hi, uh, I'm a VA audiologist. I've been with the VA for about 15 years, uh, about eight months out here in California, uh, and then before that in Connecticut at a VA hospital there and in Tennessee prior to that. Oh, well, welcome to California. So, thank you. Uh, thank yeah, welcome you. to you Northern to California. The, yeah. The West. yeah. <laughs> We're glad to have you. Thank you. All right, Bill, obviously we already introduced you, so we'll just move beyond this and, and really move the conversation much more towards well, now that we understand noise exposure in the military from their veterans' perspective, um, we understand the impact from a family member's perspective. What is really going on here? How is, how is hearing loss really in these loud noises affecting veterans? And you know, when, when might it show up? And when can they really recognize that they need to seek some help? So I think this is a difficult topic. I think oftentimes I hear that a person who has hearing loss doesn't really recognize that they have hearing loss. But before we get into that, Backing up to where the veterans talked about, you know, in the service, machine guns, vehicles, loud explosions, jets, um, you know, loud things. What really happens here when, when something exceeds maybe what we're supposed to hear uh, biologically or, or, you know, physiologically, I guess, with our, hear, with our ears? So I would say the, the simple answer there is the system saturates. And when the system saturates, then you end up uh, with that sort of muffled sensation along with the ringing that we're also used mm -hmm. to. And when you get that sensation, incrementally, it sort of compounds itself. And eventually, you end up with some sort of a long-term uh, disability out of it. How do we know when it saturates? I mean, what, what, you know, we have these ears, mm -hmm. but I don't think we're really taught, you know, uh, other than maybe a little bit of a lecture from mom and dad to yeah. keep the noise down, keep the... Mm -hmm. How do we know when we're listening to something or in an environment that's too loud? What's a, what's a good way to know that our system is being saturated? Right, so if, if any situation where you feel like you have to raise your voice to be heard, that should be a warning sign that you're in, mm, okay. in some louder noise. Uh, if, if you look at some regulations, you know, 85 decibels is kind of an action point. But each individual has different sensitivity, so always better to, to be proactive and, and wear earplugs whenever you're around any noise sources like lawn mowers or power tools, because once the hearing loss is there, it's, it's permanent. There, there's no way to, mm -hmm. to reverse any damage that's been done. Okay, so you're out mowing your lawn, you're out yeah. using the leaf blower, are you using something that exceeds 85 decibels? Is Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yep, yes. Yeah. And oftentimes I'll see people going around trying to be, you know, uh, trying to prevent hearing loss, so they'll put their ear you know, earbuds in or whatever it happens to be, and so then you're just kind of doing double damage there. Instead of actually preventing the hearing loss by putting something in, right. now you're jacking up the volume on whatever it is that you're listening to and potentially creating additional hazards. Mm -hmm. okay. I, I would say, honestly, most phones or, you know, devices or whatever, iPods, that kind of thing, you can get free apps that will, while you wouldn't use it in a, you know, an OSHA environment or something right. like that for uh, official measurements, you could easily turn around and say, hey, this thing that I'm using might be, you know, I'm questioning whether or not it's too loud. Let me get this app and take a look at it and, you know. Oh, that the phone that can sense The yeah. phone will, yeah. will sort of do yeah. some measurements yeah. for you. Calculate yeah. how many decibels. Yeah. Yeah. And then we're it, in hearing aids now since 07, and I have resound hearing aids now. These are the best set that I've had, and I can, they're tuned into my iPhone, and I can raise the volume, lower the volume, I can do all sorts of stuff, and it makes compensation if I'm in a restaurant and I have loud noises in the restaurant, that's really a problem. Sure. I can't hear a conversation, so it dampens the background a little bit, so sure. it, it gets better. But you find out about your hearing loss f from the people that are around you. Because my wife would say to me a number of years ago, why can't you hear me better? <laughs> or can you hear me now? Or she'd yell at me. And that's how you find out about it, but you gotta get some help. Yeah, it looks like we have a question from our audience. Uh, can things I did in the military 20 years ago still be affecting my hearing today? Hmm. Good question. Mm -hmm. So you know you're around loud noises in, in the military, mm -hmm. but you got out of the military, they yep. tested your hearing, everything was fine. 20 years later, something's showing up. Is that, can that be the effects of something 20 years ago? I would say sure. 
Yeah, so, so noise exposure, you tend to get you know, hearing loss at the, at the time of exposure, but you know, over the course of your life, you're exposed to a lot of noise, even both in and outside the service. And then as we get older, you know, that can compound uh, the problem with an aging process. And you know, for a lot of people, hearing loss is progressive, but not always. But definitely what happened when you were in your 20s is, is still going to be present when you're in your 50s, 60s, and, and beyond. That's right. And what you really need to do is you need to go and get an, uh, what, an audiogram or get a, yeah. get a test. Civilian doctor or go to the VA and get a test. That will tell you what your baseline is. And, and it's if I, very important. If I can uh, jump on what you were saying a second ago about your wife telling you, oh, hey, you know, you're, you're driving me nuts because you're not listening to me or you've asked me the same question five times or whatever. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, your, your family members certainly are going to be the ones that notice it before yeah. you recognize it. But one of the things that you mentioned was being able to hear in a situation with background noise. Mm -hmm. And that tends to be sort of your early sign of even before it shows up on the audiogram, hey, you know, I'm starting to have some trouble here. Uh, if everybody else is doing pretty good, maybe I should go get checked instead mm -hmm. of just, oh, well, right. it's probably fine. You know? So yeah. people kind of joke around, it's call it selective hearing loss. <laughs> but what you're talking about is that in, in groups of people, you may not have the ability to hold a conversation with them or hear someone. It's, it's, it's a person, not tune, they're not tuning something out. They're just not picking up specific, um, specific volumes or specific um, tones. Tones, yeah. okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, in small groups, you know, like around the table like this, it's fine. I can probably operate without my hearing aid. Mm. But anything else, it, it's a mm -hmm. problem. Yeah. And these things really help. Yeah. Great. So what about after hearing loss has already, what, or I guess acoustic trauma has already occurred. So you're in the service, you've already been around loud noises. Can further damage occur later on in life that, that going back to the question, could... You know, I'm just thinking about other like medical conditions. You know, someone who doesn't eat healthy, who then smokes, can lead towards heart disease, right? Compound so is issues. hearing loss the same kind of way where this, can this condition kind of build on itself? Sure. You know, can tinnitus contribute more towards the inability to perceive sound or vice versa? How, how do we understand that? So, so, you know, hearing loss and tinnitus, the you know, tinnitus, the r ringing in the ears is, is caused by the same damage to the ear that's resulting in, in the hearing loss. Um, and a lot of people feel like their tinnitus contributes to their hearing problems because there's this other sound that's there that's, you know, interfering with the external world. Uh, and, you know, as we go through our life, you know, different life events, health problems can certainly contribute to, to hearing loss. Um, and you know, just as we age, any mm -hmm. further noise exposure, like we've talked about sort of lawn care equipment mm -hmm. or if you work in a factory around machinery, all of those things can contribute to further degradation of your hearing. Having some hearing loss is not going to protect you from noise causing more hearing loss. Mm. Right. Okay. Uh, I tend to equate it when I talk to people uh, uh, in my clinic, sort of as a tendonitis kind of a thing, right? Everybody's familiar with tennis elbow, your elbow hurts, and then you give it a rest for a while, and then the elbow starts to go back to sort of a more normal uh, uh, sensation. Well, your, your ears don't do that. So it's uh, sort of a compounding issue that whatever you do, you know, it's, it, it just, that damage just stays there. And then if you're further exposed, then that damage progresses and continues to progress. Now. Um, your second career was not a very noisy career, so we wouldn't expect that to contribute in any sort of meaningful manner no, to the well, hearing loss. Well, yeah, but I was, uh, I mean, you know, I've, I've been a shooter all my life, too. Yeah, and recreational exposures will I, definitely contribute. Yeah, <laughs> but I'm very careful about that. I wear double ear protection mm. when, I, when I'm shooting actively, yeah. and you just have to be, you know, you're, you're hearing, you, I look at it as my hearing is kind of, whatever I have is now stabilized. Sure. And it's only going to get worse if I don't pay attention. Mm. And along that same topic with, uh, with firearms use, my caution for you as a guy that has spent most of my career working with law enforcement and with military who are actively exposed to weapons is that you don't want to be using um, those active noise canceling things, you know, the, the muffs that go over so that you can still hear your instructor at the range or whatever the, court, whatever the thing happens to be. My exp uh, experience with that is that people tend to develop hearing loss if that's your mm, only form of okay. protection yeah. because it, there's a little bit of a 
uh, delay before the, the electronics kick in. Okay. Uh, now, if that's a secondary form of protection and you've got earplugs underneath, then you're going to be pretty well protected. And that's, and that's what fine. I do. I put earplugs underneath, put the muffle on top. Really? And I can still hear the range command. Okay. Exactly. That's you know, good. which is important. Yeah. 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 So we've got another question, and we'd like to thank our audience for participating. Um, I still have trouble hearing in certain situations, even with my hearing aids. Can anything be done? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the important thing to remember with hearing loss and hearing aids is it's not a static situation. You need to be uh, in constant contact with your audiologist if things aren't right. And you know, that starts from the very beginning with giving a good description of your lifestyle, what kind of listening situations that you're in, so that they can have an idea of what hearing aid might be right for you and give you programs to help in those situations. And then after you take the hearing aids and use them, then you can come back in and we can make some adjustments if things aren't working out right. Most hearing aids now can connect with an app on a smartphone and allow you to make some of those changes uh, yourself. Right. And it will track the sort of changes that you're making uh -huh. and give us an idea of, of where we need to go to help you. And then beyond that, there's also some devices that can be paired with the hearing aids to connect to a TV or a remote microphone that you give to someone else so that you can hear them better in a, like in a restaurant, a noisy situation. So the, the main thing is just if something's not right, let us know and, and we'll take another look and we can try and make some adjustments. And, you know, they're not like glasses, they're never going to give you normal hearing again, so mm. we may not always be able to fix every problem, but usually we can try and make some adjustments and, and improve the situation. Mm. And I completely agree with what you say on that, and, and if you don't tell your audiologist, we assume everything's fine because, I mean, what else do we know, right? We're not with mm -hmm. you. But one of the things that I used to do when I was working with hearing aids with my patients was I'd give a uh, little, you know, uh, binders or notebooks or whatever, just a note card, essentially. Uh, and I'd give one to the patient and one to the patient's spouse. And mm -hmm. oftentimes the patient themselves doesn't realize they're having problems because they're not hearing what the other person is telling them, right? So you're talking from one side of the house to the other and you don't know that your wife's trying to reach you or whatever the right. case happens to be, right? And so that, uh, by having both pairs of people uh, fill that out, mm -hmm. sort of helps uh, us as your, your you know, provider to be able to, to set things up in a, a manner that's kind of more realistic for both <coughs> members of the family. You brought up a good point, too, just talking about the family support or whoever the person is surrounded by and just them, the outsiders kind of noticing more of the hearing loss more so than maybe the patient. Mm. So do you guys offer, aside from what your method was, was to have the note card, sure. but is there any other forms of support or anything that you guys would recommend to those who are the caregivers or the family members or mm -hmm. friends with those who have hearing loss? Yeah, we certainly en encourage people to bring their, their spouse or, or partner or family member with them to their fitting appointment so that somebody else is hearing that information as well because it, it is a lot of information to try and absorb in a fairly short period of time. And you do get some manuals to take home with you, but it's always good to have another person listening as well to remember some of the items and then we also have an oral rehab uh, course that veterans and their spouse or, or partner can attend and one of our audiologists and one of our health technicians goes over things in a lot more detail than, than in the regular fitting appointments. Okay. Was that to help them like enunciate properly or to help them just understand no, it's, like it's, deciphering lang language? or what, It's what more getting used to hearing aids and how to use the hearing okay. aids and what hearing aids can do and can't do. So it's more just an educational uh, session for related to hearing and the uh, hearing loss and the hearing aids. And a lot of it, I think, when you have your uh, your partner with you, oftentimes, uh, you know, you're not being, you, know, you live together, obviously, right? So when you sit there and you say, oh, the doc said whatever the doc said, it's oftentimes in one ear out the other, mm -hmm. or it's like, okay, well, you're just telling me that uh, you're having difficulty hearing me, and it's not really the same level of importance as when the doc says, hey, you know what, if you're going to have an important conversation, don't do it while one of you is in the kitchen and the other's in the bedroom, right? you you got to fix your communication strategies in order to have a, a smoother life. Mm -hmm. And I think from the layman's point of view, uh, I, have to be, I have to be attentive of my environment because I, I could be focused on the TV and listening to a program and my spouse is five feet away and all of a sudden she'll stand up and you're not listening to me. <laughs> you know, so you, you have to, when you have the hearing disability, you've got to pay attention to the environment because it, it's difficult and you've got to talk directly to people. <laughs>
You know, you've got to get their attention and talk directly at them, and then you're fine. Hmm. So there's a little bit of a learned behavior here and how yeah. to live in your environment. Yeah, you have to be a little more proactive and yes, having conversations with your spouse yeah. is what I'm hearing. You do. Yeah. So how does, how does quality of life factor into hearing aid and, and hearing loss type of issues? When someone gets fitted for a proper set of hearing aids and, and they, you know, they're tuned in properly, how does that affect things like relationships and work? And uh, what, what do you hear from veterans? And maybe, Bill, you want to share a little bit in terms of like how good does life get once they start to hear things that maybe they haven't been hearing for, for years? I mean, uh, uh, Carl was talking about how his son was starting to hear maybe some the things you don't want to hear, plate, but, yep. you know, the scratching of a plate. But... Um, you know, being able, being able to hear your 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 daughter or, or you know a voice that you maybe haven't been able to pick up on. Well, at the level that I'm at, you know, I uh, I can turn them up and adjust them and so yeah. forth. Uh, I'm not. I don't think I'm hearing things that I haven't heard before, as long as I pay attention. My okay. hearing loss is not that deep, but uh, uh, they make a difference. Uh, yeah, I guess in my mind I'm thinking, you know, there's these videos that pop up from time to time of a baby hearing for the very first time. So I'm just looking at like the emotions yeah. here that yeah. must come yeah. from someone who's think, who's experiencing right. sensory that they haven't had for a long time. Do you find anyone? Absolutely. So oftentimes people will complain about uh, social isolation and depression and, sure. and all that kind of yeah. uh, okay. uh, aspect of, of communication that they're missing on a day-to-day -day ba basis. Mm -hmm. and. Um, once you get fit, I mean, does it return you back to normal? Of course, as you said, no, it does not. But once you get fit, it certainly allows you, you to go back out yeah. to Starbucks and have your coffee with your buddies yeah. in the morning. And, yeah. you know, as you said, hear your, your daughter that you may not have heard or, you know, a lot of people like bird watching, for example. And, well, know, one thing I found out that. is that when, when I'm shooting, I, the hearing aids I had before were also resound, but they came behind the ear. So when I'm in the wind, they were terrible. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> Standing on the range, I had to put them in the glove compartment. Yeah. yeah. These now are in, in my ear, and that's why we did these, because the microphone's in the ear, and it, everything is a lot better yeah. from that environmental point of view. And actually, speaking of, of wind, I don't know, I can't remember if I mentioned this the last time, but I actually had a patient who uh, told me, he came back and he told me with a particular set of hearing aids that he was wearing that he was actually able to hear the, the wind from his golf swing oh. and that improved his golf wow. game. <laughs> I mean, I don't know I anything about that. golf, so. Yeah, when you get the wind in the ears, boy, it's, uh, it's loud. <laughs> We have a question here, and this really kind of invites, we have just about two minutes. I have a constant ringing in my ears. Can anything be done about it? We haven't talked a lot about tinnitus. We've talked more about the, the hearing loss. So what can be done about someone who has constant ringing in their ears? Wait, so, so with, with tinnitus ringing, there's, there's no cure. You know, there's no way to make the sound stop, make them go away. But there are things that can be done. Um, many people with tinnitus find that when they're wearing their hearing aids, they're not as aware of the ringing or, or whatever their tinnitus sounds like, because it can, it's referred to as ringing in the ears frequently, but it can manifest as many different, I'd agree. different mm -hmm. sounds, whistle, static, white noise, buzzing, it, hissing, buzzing, hissing. Mm -hmm. it's, all, it's all kind of the same thing. Mm -hmm. And it's not so much that the hearing aids are getting rid of the tinnitus, but you're hearing other things going on around you better, mm -hmm. so you don't notice it as much. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's things you can use at night if it interferes with you getting to sleep, uh, a fan turned on or a radio in between stations for white noise. Uh, there's a lot of apps you can download to a smartphone that will play environmental sounds for a period of time and then shut off. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you know, if the hearing aids themselves aren't enough, a lot of modern hearing aids can play some other sounds as well to help kind of mask the tinnitus. And at the VA, we have a, a progressive tinnitus management program. Uh, it's kind of stepwise where people who are really bothered by their tinnitus can enroll in that and uh, get some help. Yeah. Great. Well, Dr. Polilius, Dr. Yeah. Kelly, thank you so much. Bill, thanks for joining us again. Thanks for having thanks me. For having Before us. we leave you tonight, we want you to hear a veteran's voice, our monthly segment that tells a veteran's story in their own words. Enjoy. I'm so pleased to bring to the studio remotely my friend Jimmy Blackman, a former brigade commander from the 101st Airborne Division. Jimmy is also a very successful writer. And in addition, he is a three-time world archery champion. 
as well as a member of the 1998 U.S. Armed Forces World Cross Country Team. In addition to all of that, Jamie is a successful business person, and we're going to talk about some of what he's been up to today in the studio. Welcome, Jimmy. No, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's good to have you. Okay, so maybe start with a little bit of military background. Anything you want to share about your time in service? Uh, it was a way out for me. I, uh, the only thing I ever debated in high school was which shift I was going to work. The, the, the cotton mill was a foregone conclusion. That's kind of what my people did. And an Army recruiter showed up one day and asked me if I'd like to join the Army. And I saw that as a way out. And so um, that led to 30 years <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, and, and a very different military entered during the Cold War. And of course, uh, uh, retired in 2016. So the last 15 years of my career were mostly Iraq, Afghanistan. So I know that you released your first book, Pale Horse, in 2017. Can you tell us a little bit about that book? Yeah, so Pale Horse covers um, the 2008 to 10 uh, command when I was in command uh, of, of Task Force Pale Horse. Um, that was a horrific year of fighting. Um, I was involved to some degree of, um, in the battles in which five medals of honor were earned. And, um, it was take, took place in the valleys where the attacks of nine 11 were planned and rehearsed. Um, the, the bloodiest piece of terrain on the planet, very emotional year, a lot of casualties, a uh, very difficult, emotional decision-making all year. I wanted to, to come back and tell that story. And that's what wound up being pale horse. And then Cowboys Over Iraq, which comes out February 4th of this year. Tell us a little bit about what you focus on in that book. So there's a, there's a couple of different themes. I really, um, in pale horse, one of the biggest, um, I guess compliments I got was thanks for taking the time to introduce us to these young soldiers, America's sons and daughters, which ironically is the reason, uh, McMillan was my publisher for pale horse. And, uh, but I've still got the rejection letters from editors of other major, um, you know, uh, comp publishing companies. And many of them were concerned about there are too many characters. There's too much detail about all these, these characters. And fortunately my agent said, stick with it. We, we, we're going to do this the way you want it done. And uh, Mark Resnick at, at McMillan said, I, I, I love it. I would never ask you to take those guys out. And now that has been something that has really been a plus for that book of people really enjoy to see that these young men and women who, who fought for 16, 17 years now, they're kids from any town USA. And uh, to get to see them and the heroic things that they've done, um, I think, was very important. So that was, that came out of Pale Horse. Cowboys Over Iraq, I decided to spend a lot more time in the space between battles. Yes. Uh, where does that brotherhood form? It, it isn't, you know, just battles fought. Um, it, it's the, the time down between. Uh, in Cowboys, you'll see uh, Xbox came out and one of the soldier's wife mailed him an Xbox and this uh, Halo game. It's a first person shooter game. And we became obsessed with it. We go do missions until two or three o'clock in the morning, come back and just kind of decompress, um, you know, messing around with each other and trying to feebly play this video game. And um, it, it's those moments where you realize how close you are to these guys. You talk about the character profiles. And that was my favorite part of your writing. You're a storyteller, you know, and you really bring to life people that you served with in a way that um, you can just feel like you know them almost. And not even the people, you know, from our country, but there was an Australian soldier that, um, was that in Pale Horse or was that in Cowboys? No, that's Iraq? Cowboys. That's Cowboys over Iraq. Yeah. That, you know, became just one of the brotherhood. You know, I really liked all of those characters and those that white space, you know, between all the action is really yeah. about that bond of camaraderie. So uh, I really well, that ability it. to to tell the story um, was the environment I grew up in. I, I grew up in at the knee of old men and bib overalls, dirt poor in North Georgia that would sit on a porch on Friday and Saturday night and just tell stories. I mean, yeah. these colorful, charismatic stories that 
you know, they could make you taste the blood in your mouth from a fist that punched them in 1958 in a beer joint in North Georgia. <laughs> Old women that could describe holding a baby and you could smell it. I mean, just these powerful stories. I grew up just mesmerized at listening to those stories and it influenced how I tell stories. It was just a matter of now, how do you take those stories um, and, and turn it into a narrative? Yeah, absolutely. The experience of those who serve and how they think about events that happen, such as the recent events um, that have happened, you know, just in the past week and thought you had put out a post on LinkedIn that I shared that was really thoughtful. And I feel that you're credible as a source because you know the cost of war. Your songs and your writings reflect the cost of war and the beauty of the bonds between those who serve. And I just wanted to give you an opportunity to share some thoughts about recent events, um, you know, as far as your, your perspective. Yeah, it's interesting. I had no idea that, I, I mean, it was timely to write that. Um, I, I felt like it was being spun politically with, with Suleimani being killed and, you know, this idea, which is crazy, a potential world war and a draft and everything else. It just got out of hand. Then the, the media was spinning it to right and left. And, and, and I felt like, you know, I, I wanted to, to write something that, that would give a perspective that was balanced and, and hopefully strategic and thought. That thing has been reshared like 168 times. I had no idea it would touch people in that way. But the, the bottom line, you know, was he a bad guy? I, there's no question that there's, there's, you know, he was arguably indirectly responsible for about 60% of American casualties in the Iraq war. I, I don't think Americans knew that. And I, I don't think we strategically communicate these things to Americans yeah. very well. So yeah. the public's uninformed and then something like this happens right. and you have this emotional gut response. Um, certainly a guy that, that needed to go, um, but we have to be very careful and measured in terms of, uh, one of the things that I talk to my guys a lot about, uh, you know, trip after trip to Iraq and Afghanistan, it takes as much or more discipline to know when not to shoot. Mm -hmm. Um, you have to think strategically of second and third order effects. Um, if this, then what? Right. And, um, and so I, I think this was a good move. They had to be checked. Iran has been out of control and unchecked for quite a while, much as China was when they were building islands in the South China Sea and East China Sea during the Obama administration. Um, that stopped. They've been checked. And this isn't a political statement. I don't want people to take that context. It's a fact. They have stopped. Uh, the, the trade, uh, the tariffs have, have made them made hard decisions. And now Iran has been checked. They have to respond to this, but how we continue to play the chess game, we want de-escalation now. Uh, yeah. We did something to let them know we're not going to stand idly by, which was a good move, but now let's de-escalate this because the last thing we want to know, and you know what I think resonated in my post with people so most is, you know, I remember having a recurring calendar event weekly for memorial services. Yeah. It didn't matter if someone was dead or not. They will be by the next memorial service and we will have one. Well, part of you know, you've had a recurring memorial service on your calendar weekly. Yeah. And you stood there and understood in a very textured way what that yeah. feels like, that experience. It, it's hard to put it into perspective, I think. It's personal for those who have yes. served and, and grieved, you know, the loss of their military brothers and sisters. And, you know, that's part of the gap, I think, in the society with the military is that grief gap, is that lack of kind of um, direct personal experience with that kind of loss and that amount of loss. And I think you're absolutely right that another part is that, you know, the public does not know who these people are that we are really targeting. There is no deck of cards that's shared for public consumption in terms of who the targets are as far as um, adversaries of the United States and people that have been responsible for the deaths of so many of our troops. And so when someone is taken out, there's this outcry because people have no context for it. Um, and, so, and quite yeah. frankly, to add to that, uh, the average citizen who is not served at the highest governmental levels in D.C., I think are ignorant of what our elected officials know. 
you know, the, the, the targeting deck is in Iraq or Afghanistan and, and that's shared across communities within DC, uh, very closely held. But to think that even the president or the vice president um, knows every one that we're targeting and why and everything they've done, mm-hmm. that's just not true. Uh, many of these are, because I'll hear things like, well, you know, we don't know the intel they had and everything. That's true. But most times it is a, okay, we've got an emerging opportunity on a guy we've been following for a long time here's the facts lay out the background this is why we think it's a go or a no-go and and those senior elected officials then have to make a decision i'm not saying that was the case with Suleimani, but it often is yeah. everybody knew who osama bin laden was but but we sometimes ignorantly think that that everyone's informed of everything just because of a position they're in they're not well i definitely agree and i appreciate your perspective um and your writing, you know, it's just such a pleasure to read your stories and I'm looking forward to seeing where things go with your music. Thank you for coming on to the show and let me know if you're ever out in California and um, are up for doing some kind of a concert out here. I'd, I'd be a very enthusiastic supporter. Oh, I'd love it. Thanks for having me. Bye. Thank you for tuning in to the show tonight. We hope you've enjoyed this important discussion. If you or someone you know needs help with hearing issues, let Veterans Voices help connect you with resources that you need. To get started accessing the wide variety of services available to veterans, contact the Contra Costa County Veterans Service Office at 925-313-1481. To see an audiologist or any other medical needs, you can reach the Martinez VA Medical Center at 925-372-2000. Veterans Voices is brought to you in part by contributions from the 2020 Census. Now more than ever, it is important for veterans to, be, to stand up and be counted. The Veterans Affordable Home Program, serving those who have served us, ensuring the American dream for our veterans, and the Diablo Valley Veterans Foundation, dedicated to helping veterans near you. To rewatch tonight's episode, check back on our homepage later this week or check your cable provider's schedule for rebroadcast times. You can also, uh, excuse me, you can also rewatch this episode and many others on our YouTube channel, Veterans Voices of Contra Costa. So be sure to subscribe. Our next show will be Monday, March 9th at 7 p.m. We will talk about preventing violence. Very interesting topic. Be sure to tune in from our whole family here at Veterans Voices. Thanks for watching. Have a great evening.